Good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's get started. Welcome to the fourth annual celebration of the Jacob K. Javits Prize for Bipartisan Leadership. I'm Josh Javits, a member of the board of the Jacob K. and Marion B. Javits Foundation, which established the prize. And we have a couple of board members here, Jeff, Jeffrey Kyle and Mark uh, Kaufman are here. And we have been working with our partners, Results for America, uh, with support from the uh, Bechtel Foundation. The Javits Prize is given to individuals who have taken on an issue of major importance and forged agreement across partisan lines. Bipartisan lines, we, I should say. The atmosphere here suggests partisanship. We're for bipartisanship. We're especially thrilled to celebrate three win the three winners in 2019, the late Senator Richard Luger, Republican of Indiana, for his lifetime of bipartisan legislative work, and Representatives Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat of New York, and Doug Collins, Republican of Georgia, uh, for their exemplary work on the First Step Act, which we'll hear more about later. The prize is named after my father, Senator Jacob K. Javits, Republican, who represented New York for 24 years in the Senate. Throughout his career, he was able to find legislative solutions to national problems. He looked for the best ideas, whether they came from the left or the right, and worked tenaciously across party lines to fashion them into effective legislation. He never demonized opponents. He never oversimplified complex issues. Rather, he worked constructively to meet the concerns and ideas raised by both sides of the aisle. And that's the approach and the spirit that we honor today. A few words about the process for selecting our prize winners. Uh, we used a two-step process. The first step uh, was, is the nomination process. We elicited nominations from experts in bipartisanship, leaders of civic organizations, universities, uh, former government officials, uh, and they nominated senators and members of Congress uh, whose bipartisan work advanced the public interests in a significant way. Step two was the selection process, and there we brought together eminent legislative practitioners and other leaders, including Erskine Bowles, the Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton, and Ken Duberstein, Chief of Staff to President Ronald Reagan. They carefully evaluated the accomplishments of the nominees and selected those we celebrate today. Senator Luger also participated in the selection uh, of the prize winners in the past, each year before he passed away. He would use the bipartisanship scores calculated by the Luger Center in evaluating the nominees, which was a tremendously uh, helpful and uh, persuasive uh, statistics. This morning, we're honored to have uh, senators and members of Congress from both sides of the aisle joining us in our celebration. Thank you, uh, Representative Adriano Espiat, a Democrat of New York, who is a fellow member of the New York congressional delegation, uh, you know, working closely with Senator with Representative Jeffries, and Senator Todd Young, who worked for and with Senator Luger and developed bonds with him based on mutual respect and a shared belief in the power of cooperation and compromise. Today we'll have a, a short a video about the First Step Act. Uh, and remarks uh, from my sister Carla about the work of Congressman Jeffries and Collins. Then Congressman Jeffries and Collins will join us for a panel discussion on the future of bipartisanship and, and criminal justice reform in the U.S. Congress, which will be led by veteran uh, political commentator Stu Rothenberg, uh, the senior editor of Inside Elections and a columnist for Roll Call. My sister Joy is here and will introduce Senator Luger's son, John Luger, uh, the executive director of the Luger Center, who will be accepting the prize on behalf of the Luger family. All of this will be followed by a, uh, a reception. But first, I'm pleased to welcome uh, a leading senator who has a history of working across the aisle to get things done, a Naval Academy graduate, a Marine, uh, and a, a current Indiana senator Senator Todd Young. Todd.
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, uh, thank you for all who helped make this, uh, this occasion possible. Results for America, the, the Javits Foundation, um, the Luger Center. Uh, I, I dubbed it today the Luger Diaspora. I see a lot of uh, former Luger staffers out there, uh, members of the Luger family. It's, it's great to be with you again. So I, I'm really privileged to be here as someone who used to work for Senator Luger for a period of time to um, do my little part to honor his legacy. I know we have a full agenda today, so I'll compress my remarks a bit. As uh, one of my friends once said, be bold, be brief, and be gone. So I'll try and do that, all right? So we know Senator Luger spent 36 years as a member of the United States Senate, and his service helped make the world a better place, a safer place. I worked for him for a fairly brief period of time, uh, about two years in the early 2000s, but that time on his staff made a deep impression on me. I had a front row seat, I felt, from day one to history being made. I was watching a statesman work at his craft, and he stood by me as I took the oath of office. I'll never forget his support through the subsequent years. Senator Luger was a Rhodes Scholar, he was a Navy veteran, mayor of Indianapolis, and of course, a United States Senator. He led on a range of different issues, food security, energy independence, free trade. And at a time when nuclear proliferation was civilization's greatest threat, I think it's fair to say that Senator Luger helped save the world. When he passed away in April of this year, it was clear to me the country needed to do something big, something befitting his legacy as a Navy veteran, a public servant, and a chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. This week, we secured such a tribute. At a ceremony in Indianapolis on Monday, I was proud to announce in the presence of his family and many friends back home in Indiana that a future naval guided missile destroyer will be named the USS Richard G. Luger. Now, of course, the ship will be around for a while. It, too, will serve with distinction. But as with all ships, as with all things, it will eventually fall into disrepair. It will be decommissioned, decommissioned. But we know that Senator Luger's legacy will endure. He's just too good for it not to. As a boss, a role model, and a person, Richard Luger was and is the gold standard. He leaves a legacy, I would say, for all of us, not just for public leaders, but for leaders of all stripes. He's an exemplar of wisdom, civility, and of bipartisanship, really often of nonpartisanship. He always stayed true to his temperament. He was a quiet, dignified statesman. He never tried to be somebody he wasn't. He thought before he spoke, he emphasized substance over personality, facts over opinions. In short, he set the bar for public leaders and for leaders more generally. So may we draw inspiration from his example, all of us in our own way, and may God watch over Dick Luger and his family. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, it's now my pleasure to present a short video uh, highlighting the work of two uh, of this year's prize recipients. It's titled, First Step Forward, A Bipartisan Victory. more people incarcerated in America than in any other country in the world per capita. It's a stain on our society, which has led to families and individuals and communities being devastated. Why are we spending the massive amounts of money to keep people incarcerated that could be getting out so that when they did get out, they didn't return? 
These individuals are amongst the least, the lost, and the left behind. And we have an opportunity in a bipartisan way to make a difference in their lives in so many areas. Congressman Jeffries and I believe yes to the future. I know that when we have worked on this, it is about what we can accomplish and how we can accomplish it in a way that is meaningful to others. Hakeem Jeffries and I authored the First Step Act. The First Step Act is criminal justice reform legislation that was done in a bipartisan way to strike a blow against the mass incarceration epidemic that we have in America. Doug Collins was the lead Republican who's a conservative from rural Georgia. I'm a progressive from the People's Republic of Brooklyn. Doug and I disagree on a whole host of issues, but we agree on the need to deal with overcriminalization in America. This bill would have not been worth anything if it hadn't affected people's lives to where they change and where they have the ability to control their life again. I grew up in Southeast San Diego. At a young age, I started running with gang members. I became involved in selling crack cocaine. And that led right up to me being arrested for a drug conspiracy. For that, I was sentenced to 25 years. During my time in prison, I did an Associate's of Arts degree in general studies. I did the general business certificate program. And I got the Bachelor's of Science in Small Business Management. And this just kind of gives you like the I believe that people have the opportunity to not only learn, but to change their worldview. Once you look at the world in a different way, you'll never react to the world the same way. The First Step Act will incentivize prisoners to participate in evidence-based recidivism reduction programs. So this bill allows prisoners to earn an additional seven days off their sentence each year they demonstrate good behavior. It funds important job training, drug treatment, and education services. The one thing about this bill, it never took away from the fact that in the eyes of the law, something wrong was done. But the question became, how do we then make the system benefit society as much as the person going through it. We understood that there was an underlying consensus emerging to try to tackle this issue in a way that had support from both progressives and conservatives. Hakeem and I sat down and said, what can we do now? We knew the pitfalls of actually passing legislation in this town. I was able to use my influence to those who may have been skeptical of looking at criminal justice reform and Hakeem being able to go to the more liberal side or the progressive side who said this doesn't go far enough. And so this is what partnerships look like. There were times when the right tried to kill the First Step Act and there were moments when the left tried to kill the First Step Act, but we were able to fight through it all with a broad bipartisan consensus, which is what you need in this town in order to get things done. We took it from the perspective we're not going to get everything. Here's how we get it out of the House. We go to the Senate, we let them add on some stuff because when it comes back, there's an understanding that there was a, a meeting in, in the middle. You find the path to start with and you say, here's what's workable. The First Step Act was supported by the ACLU and the Koch brothers, the NAACP and the Heritage Foundation, progressives and conservatives ultimately leading to a bill that was embraced by the president and signed into law. Based on the First Step Act, I was released from federal prison just less than three weeks ago. On the 25 year term I was sentenced to, I actually only served 17 and a half years. Right now I'm living with my sister Pamela Wood and my nephew, Osiris. If we view the tangible impact of the First Step Act as people getting released from prison early, the intangible act is the hope that it provides. Soon as I got out, I started an MBA degree with the help of the Prison Scholar Fund, and I'm about to transfer to San Diego State I was in pursuit of a better me. We are here in the United States Congress to deal with issues of importance to the American people. And many of us don't see problems as 
Democratic issues or Republican issues, but as American issues that should be confronted in a bipartisan way. If we want to find common ground, that's when we have the civility of saying, I'm passionate about my ideas, but I'm willing to listen to your ideas and say, how do we make this work? When we see that, that's when we see actual change happen. Telling the filmmakers, it made me cry every time I've watched this. <laughs> great, uh, it's, a, it's a great presentation of what we're, we're here about today. I'm Carla Javits. Uh, I am with the Javits Foundation, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I wanted to recognize uh, Jeffrey Kyle, Mark Kaufman, who are also here with the foundation. Um, when he was running for re-election in 1974, our father took part in a heated debate at the City Club of New York. Taking fire from the left and right, he responded, my opponent makes fun of me for being the great compromiser. Well, compromise produced the War Powers Act. Compromise produced pension reform. Compromise produced legal services for the poor and cancer research. Compromise has to be. You can't have great, pious, beautiful ideas, but no performance. In 2019, we enthusiastically award the Javits Prize for Bipartisan Leadership to recognize two lawmakers who exemplify these values. One of the most significant bipartisan achievements of this current Congress was the passage of the First Step Act, as you saw in the video. This reform not only unlocked prison doors for some, but their potential to contribute to the community, uh, to the economy, to their families. Congress had tried for years to pass criminal justice reform legislation, but it wasn't until the two gentlemen we recognize today joined forces that Congress was successful. It took months of late night calls, lobbying, and tough negotiations, and each of these lawmakers took political heat from members of their own party as well as outside groups. But as Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy noted, together, they were relentless to get this important reform on the floor. The First Step Act was actually the third piece of legislation Representatives Jeffries and Collins ushered through Congress together. This prize recognizes each of these two highly effective, respected members of Congress and their partnership. Over my father's lifetime of service, he aimed to make progress for the American people and to strengthen the treasure that is U.S. democracy. His huge smile would grace us today if he were here to see this legacy honored so magnificently. Congratulations to Representatives Jeffries and Representative Collins. If both of you would please come forward, it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York, Congressman Doug Collins of Georgia, and our moderator, Stuart Rothenberg. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to look at bipartisanship and to appreciate it. Uh, it would be nice if uh, other members would feel the same. Okay, so I have, uh, we have about 15 or 20 minutes, Congressman, to talk about uh, kind of the specifics of the legislation, but also generally about the Hill and tone and bipartisanship. So I, I, as I understand it, the first time you work, guys worked together was on the songwriter Equity Act, is that correct? How did that come about? How did you guys hook up on that? And how did it lead to the, uh, the First Step Act? Well, I, good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, uh, certainly with the Javits Foundation and to Carla and to Joshua, to the entire foundation. Um, it's a wonderful award for anyone to re receive, certainly to receive it with Doug Collins you know, who's a good man, a hardworking man, an intelligent man, a family man, a God-fearing man, and a Georgia Peach man. <laughs> it's a great combination, and he's been a phenomenal partner uh, to work with. And certainly in the name of Senator Javits, as someone who now has the privilege to serve in New York, 
a state that he represented so incredibly well uh, over the years. In terms of the Songwriter Equity Act, the thing that I've enjoyed the most about the Judiciary Committee, which is often viewed as one of the more intense committees on the other side of the Capitol, because we have jurisdiction over some tough issues like reproductive rights, women's rights, civil rights, voting rights, gun ownership rights, and immigration rights, where the left and the right don't always see eye to eye. And the committee can attract partisan warriors for that reason. But there was also a great tradition on the Judiciary Committee because we have jurisdiction over things like intellectual property, content, the internet, copyright, patent, trade. But in the intellectual property space, there was this long tradition of working together to solve problems in the context of the Judiciary Committee, particularly in the music space. And you had champions, for instance, like John Conyers and Howard Coble. Uh, and music, of course, is a universal language. It brings people together. So you had Conyers, who was a big jazz aficionado, and Coble was all about bluegrass, and Doug Collins from Georgia, country music, and you know, Hakeem Jeffries from Brooklyn, hip hop and R&B. <laughs> but it was music, it's a universal language. Though Doug, Doug has some hip hop knowledge, though, I will say that. I don't want to shortchange him. Uh, but, but music is a universal language, so it brings people together. That has been the case in the country, and it certainly was the case in the Judiciary Committee. So we partnered together to help songwriters, uh, and that was our first project. Yeah. It was really interesting. You know, the thing that comes up here that I find so often, and Hakeem and I have uh, been able to bridge this, is that it's amazing to me how many people who get elected from different districts, they come up here and they run right into the partisan wall. Well, as I call it, they run right into the issues that you know are are known, and it's easy. And I think that's the the part that we we take into granted that it's it's easy to stay where you are comfortable. And I think from our past experiences, and when you see a man such as Hakeem, you see the party, his own party, recognizing his leadership, his amazing talent, and his you know his roots and his background at, at home, and our faith that connects us uh, in many ways, even though we came from you know, very two very different backgrounds. What we both found was is, is we could take the easy path. There's no doubt in our districts what our district looks like. My district is extreme, is the third most Republican. His is way up there on the Democratic side as well. So the question is, is we could have a life up here of going through the motions, doing interviews, and, and getting by. But I think we both had an inner drive that said we need to do something uh, together. So this was why I'd reached out and he had reached back. You know, that's the way always a good relationship starts instead of having your hand reached out and bit. And sometimes that happens up here. So music was a, a common ground for us. We started on Songwriter Equity Act. It's amazing. It took six years to get that music modernization passed. But that's where it started. It started with just one invitation that has opened up into a lot of different areas. And uh, look, I, something's always said about civility and, and bipartisanship. There's nothing about that anybody, I think, would look at, at this man right here and say he's backed up on any of his values and what he believes and who he is and, and how he portrays himself. And I, I definitely am not backing up on what I believe. But our founders found a way to say, be passionate about who you are, but find a way at the end of the day to say, not everything is a hill to die on. Not everything is gonna be the, the thing that is the thing that stops it. So we found a way to come together. Music provided the perfect alternative. In some ways, it provided a soundtrack to bipartisanship. Ah, um, some people though would say criminal justice is inherently a more controversial issue than songwriting. <laughs> By the way, Congressman Jeffries, I would have taken you for a Sinatra guy. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> New York, New York. <laughs> um, so how did you go from something that is kind of clearly less ideological to something which is m more politically explosive, and particularly because there were and possibly are still elements in DOJ that oppose the legislation? So I wonder if you could talk about how you went from the songwriters to the first step, and, and also about have you done anything to try to... Um, make sure that there's no backsliding from DOJ on the bill? Uh, well, of course, I think I'm gonna start with your, your, your original question. How did we get here? It, it's simple, it's trust. I trust this man, and I believe he trusts me. 
And it comes from, you know, it's experience in life. You, the, the way you get there in anything in life is you just don't jump off the deep end and say, okay, we're going to take on this massive project, and I don't know who you are, you don't know who I am, this is not the military, I'm in the military, and that's the way boot camp is. But after six weeks or 12 weeks of, of military training, you start to bond together because you start to trust each other. And so we went from things that we could, you know, agree on that people could come around, and we come into criminal justice reform, and we started this process, there was a trust that I would have his back and he would have my back. And even when we were fighting, and it's sort of funny to see the comers owners now, as we sort of like to say, that fought it desperately and then said, oh, yes, let's do it. You know, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You know, better late than never. But, um, but I think that's where it come from was a trust factor. And then we also had a change at, at DOJ. And frankly, we've seen, at least from our perspective, there's always things that could be done better. But I think the Attorney General has stepped forward. He says, and from his perspective, this is the law of the land, and the Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Rosen, has actually taken that on. So I think in a bigger picture, we've seen that. But at the time, DOJ was, frankly, I was fighting the administration in, in that regard. So, but it was a trust between the two of us that started, and everybody saw that. Yeah, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Doug. And also, I think part of the foundation was laid. We came in in the same class in 2012, and we were put on the Judiciary Committee at the same time. And Doug did something that I think was incredibly important. Early on, uh, as a freshman member, and he's emerged as a tremendous leader on the other side of the aisle in the Congress, but as a freshman member, he called together uh, some of the new members of the Judiciary Committee from the left and the right, and I have one of the most democratic districts in the country, top five, easily. And he said, we're all gonna be here for a long period of time as long as we're continuing to serve our people, serve them well, serve them authentically, because we're in what you would call safe districts, safe democratic, safe Republican districts. And we should look to find common ground, but let's begin by getting to know each other. And it was incredibly thoughtful, it was prescient, and it really laid an authentic foundation of trust so that I can get to know Doug, not just as as a, as a Republican from a conservative part of the country in Georgia, but as a person committed to doing the right thing and to finding common ground. And so I think, you know, starting with that meeting, for me, that really laid the eventual foundation for coming together on criminal justice reform. Yes, a tough issue, but one where increasingly people on the left and on the right began to see that in a country where we incarcerate more people per capita than any other nation in the world, including China and Russia combined, that that is a stain on our democracy. It hurts families, hurts communities, hurts individuals, hurts economic productivity, hurts the taxpayer in terms of a broken criminal justice system, and, and that provided a basis for trying to come together. Well, let me follow up on uh, some of these comments. And the most obvious question, the basic question, I think, is do your colleagues care about bipartisanship? Because we hear all this talk about playing to the base. What does the base want? When most of your colleagues come here, let's, let's stipulate that you've behaved differently. You've demonstrated a commitment. But do your colleagues have that same kind of commitment, or is the sense of it's, easiest, it's easier just to play to the base back home? Well, it's, def it's definitely easier to play to the base back home. I mean, but the, but the thing about it is that we have become in a, in a you know, the 24-hour the cycle, the Twitter cycle, the Facebook, the, you know, the, everybody has the, the immediacy of news. In fact, it's sort of crazy. I remember being just berated a few years ago from a, uh, I, I got this phone call that a uh, constituent had called my office and was just, just chewing out one of our interns, which is a no-no in my office, by the way. You, know, you can chew me out all the time, but you're not gonna touch my staff. And so I called this guy back and I said, what are you, you know, one, never do that again. Number two, um, what's your problem? And he was discussing a bill that it came out on a social media post from another office and wanted to know why I wasn't supporting the bill. The bill had not been introduced yet. And I told him this in no uncertain terms, and, but it goes back to this idea that there's such a cycle that is out there. Um, and I tell you, this year, we've been able to accomplish a little bit. We've got the CASE Act, which is, is moving forward. 
But um, if somebody asks me this, and this may sound sort of funny because he is a passionate defender and I'm a passionate defender on our both sides and we're having to deal with judiciary, which has been, a, frankly, it's been a, it's been a struggle this year, okay? Um, if I could say one thing about 2019 is I, I miss our bipartisanship. <laughs> I miss him. And we talk on the floor and we, we struggle on the floor, but there, there's a friendship that's endured here that if we wasn't doing this tomorrow, I still care deeply about him, and I think he cares deeply about me, and I think that overcomes a lot of it. Well, uh, that, did you go ahead, Congressman? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's exactly right, and I think part of the power of what Doug was able to show in terms of his leadership, and what we tried to demonstrate, those of us who are working on the First Step Act on the Democratic side, Cedric Richmond, Karen Bass, others, all of whom took a risk was at the end of the day, uh, we think the American people would embrace doing the right thing and coming together. And I found over the last year or so that telling the story of what Doug and I were able to work on and the fact that, as Doug indicated, he is one of the most passionate, effective defenders of the perspectives that the other side of the aisle has in the Congress and never backs away from that. Uh, but that's part of what I grew to respect in Doug and in Trey Gowdy and in Jason Chavitz and some of the other newer members that I got to know when I first got on Judiciary Committee. But being able to know when there's a lane that we're articulating different positions, but there's a lane where we come together to try to get things done fundamentally for the American people and pursue that with the same passion, the same energy, or the same commitment uh, is something that I found the American people embrace at the end of the day, particularly when you can show a work product. Do you think it would be more, it would be helpful if members spent more time socializing with one another across parties? There's a lot of criticism that members here, they rush back to the district, to campaign, or to, to um, um, uh, work the folks back home, and they're not, that in the 40s and 50s and even the 60s, they, they interacted more in Washington and, and came to understand each other as people, not simply as ideologues. Do you think that would, that would help? I, th I think so. And, um, you know, Doug alluded to something yes uh, just a moment ago. And you know, we've had an opportunity to catch up with each other over the last couple of days on the floor of the House of Representatives talking about presidential accountability. Um, not the easiest conversation to have, <laughs> but I've had fun doing it because I love Doug and we can articulate different perspectives but understand that we um, if you know that we respect the fact that the house was meant to be the institution closest to the people and to reflect the hopes the dreams the aspirations and in the words of our founders the passions of the people so we can embrace the passions that we all bring to a variety of different issues, even when we're on the opposite sides, but fundamentally recognize the humanity of each other, the authenticity of what we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, I think we, because of the intensity of Washington right now, the House floor is probably where you can, or in committee, but the House floor is definitely where you get an opportunity to interact with each other. Um, though not enough, and I do think that the more we could interact with each other in that sort of setting, the better off the country would be. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, the, the good thing that I think is the, the greatest thing, and I'm gonna take on part of what Hakeem just said is, is we've developed a relationship that is beyond members of Congress, okay? And we, we understand, and I understand his, his role, and he is, is doing such a great job as the Majority Caucus Chair. He's, he's doing that so well. I have a role as ranking member in judiciary, and, and we go back and forth. But at the end of the day, this is Hakeem, I'm Doug. And we can look at each other, and like we sit on the floor even this last night. He looked at me and said, like, are you kidding me? And I look back at him and say, oh, come on, get over it. You know, and you know, <laughs> We, we just know each other, and I think that's the, the part. But he also hit on something a second ago that was really important, is you have to compromise, and you can go into a lot of detail about this, but the reality of it is, is finding solutions, call it compromise, call it whatever you want to call it, is the art of finding what each person has and needs and finding a way to get there. 
And when we look at it from this perspective, we, I broke it down in pretty simple, and we went to how many of those events where we would pair up and we'd go to events that were uh, liberal groups, and they would look at me like, they look at Hakeem like, why are you letting him in here? And um, we go to conservative groups, and the, the same thing would be true. But we found a commonality, and it was, it was really what I, I broke down to simply uh, as an analogy of M&Ms, money and morals. That we found a way I could convince, I could talk to, you know, because many times a conservative, you know, especially up here, was talk, well, what about money? What about budget? What about that? Well, I can go straight to it. Why are we spending this much money to get a product that is, that is a bad rate? You're going to spend the money either way. Why don't we do it for a positive? Why don't we look to actually improve people's lives because we had a deep-seated belief that nobody that you'll see today is not dearly beloved by their creator. And we knew that. But then there's also that moral part of it is saying we got to do something for those that, uh, you know, made a mistake. I mean, in this room today, just think for a second in your quietness before you share it with anybody else. There we go, with the grace of God go I. That's something we had to think about, but that's the when the bond really kicks in. And I think one of the most important lessons, uh, Stu, if you don't mind, yeah. um, that we, uh, that I learned from the First Step Act effort that can be applied moving forward is that if, that you can arrive at a position traveling along a different journey philosophically, but still get to the same end. And so, for instance, progressives might conclude that we have to do something about overcriminalization and mass incarceration because of a viewpoint anchored in social, racial, or economic justice, what many may view as the failed war on drugs and the devastation that that has wrecked. And there's sympathy for that in elements on the other side of the aisle. But, but that conservatives may say, when you look at mass incarceration and overcriminalization, as Doug just articulated, that fiscally, you're know, spending $80 billion per year on overcriminalization is a waste of taxpayer dollars and a failed government program that is not yielding the reciprocal benefits to the taxpayer when you have a recidivism rate that's incredibly high. And you've got evangelicals or the religious right who are authentically committed theologically, and I understood this growing up and still attending a black Baptist church in central Brooklyn, to the principle of redemption, that everyone deserves a second chance. And that's anchored in the theology of evangelicals and Christian conservatives, and it's authentic. And then, of course, libertarians uh, who believe that um, government overreach is a problem. And sometimes that takes the form in the libertarian view of overtaxation, and Democrats and Republicans may disagree on that, or overregulation. We may say it's consumer protection. They may say it's overreach into business, and there's authentic differences there. But around criminal justice reform came to the conclusion that if you're concerned about government overreach, there's no area where it is potentially more dangerous than when the government can take away your life or your liberty. And so you get overcriminalization as a problem. And so if you can authentically arrive at the same position, even if it's a different path that you travel, um, we knew that we had a recipe uh, to ultimately get something over the finish line, and thankfully we did. We have one minute, so I will ask two questions. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, pick, you can pick what you want to answer. Um, first question is, I'll ask them both right, consecutively, You've said all the right things, but you will leave here and you'll go on a cable network and somebody will put a microphone in your face and the tone will be very different. Yep. <clears throat> um, how much of a problem is that and how can, do we need to change that? And second of all, hold on, Congressman, second of all, do you have any future specific plans for working together again on other legislation? Pick one. I'll take the first one. No, it's not a problem. Because, it, I mean, look at it. I have to represent a constituency that expects me to represent their values and represent in, in such a way. Now, I've also, here's an interesting thing. For both of us, this picture right here loses us votes, okay? <laughs> Let's just, I mean, I, I love him to death, but it loses me votes and loses him probably more votes, okay? You know. Um, but there's a difference in kicking your philosophy and keeping that. In fact, I think the people would not view it authentically if we were not articulating his Democratic point of view and articulating a Republican point of view. But at the end of the day, we still can get stuff done. This is the part that is the dichotomy, and this has got to stop. 
I disagree with Hakeem on most every other, a lot of other issues, but with a lot of areas where we can, criminal justice reform. But I do not, and this is something we've got to stop, and the American people got to, I don't hate him. I don't believe he is a terrible person. I don't believe he is evil. And we've got to stop that part of it. We can be harsh with each other, but we can't do that. I'm hesitant to respond because that's what we would call in Brooklyn a drop the mic moment. <laughs> um, but I just associate myself with everything that Doug uh, has said in, in, in that regard. And I would just say that I think, to your question, Stu, there are some things that we're working on, intellectual property, the CASE Act, uh, as it relates to small creators. Uh, but I think the magic of the moment as it relates to things like the First Step Act or the Music Modernization Act is that people who disagree authentically on a variety of issues come together. And in part, the American people, when they see what I call a coalition of the unusual suspects come together, it captures the imagination of people within this town, it captures the imagination of the American people, and it's consistent with the founding vision of this country where people came together to form the republic, had different ideas, but were committed to the great American experiment, committed to American exceptionalism. And I think notwithstanding all of these challenging times, we're just an indication, a small indication, that America will endure, and we're going to continue our long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. Thank you so much. The art of finding solutions, that's the, that's the key. That was beautiful. Richard Lugar served as a United States Senator from the state of Indiana from 1977 to 2013. In 2006, Time Magazine selected Senator Lugar as one of America's 10 best senators. And in 2013, President Barack Obama named him as a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. A former mayor and an internationally respected statesman, he was known for his bipartisan leadership, his commitment to civility, and his relentless pursuit of solutions that made America stronger and the world safer. His most lasting achievements were forged through bipartisan partnership, including his signature legislation with Democratic Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. During Senator Lugar's tenure in the Senate, he served as both chairman and ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and twice served as chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee. The, he built bipartisan support for legislation that modernized America's federal farm programs. To accept the 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award for Senator Lugar, we are honored to have with us the Senator's son, John Lugar. John is the executive director of the Luger Center, which has become a prominent bipartisan voice on issues that framed much of Senator Luger's career, non-proliferation, global food security, foreign assistance effectiveness and global development, and energy security. Please join me in welcoming John Luger. Good morning. Uh, again, I'm John Luger. I'm uh, Senator Luger's third son, uh, the executive director of the Luger Center here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on behalf of the Luger family, I'm pleased to accept the award for my father. 
We thank the Javits Foundation and the Javits family, in particular uh, Josh and Carla, for this exceptional honor. My dad deeply respected his colleague, Senator Javits, as an effective leader who followed his conscience and who had been enormously proud to receive the Javits Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Richard Lugar offered a model of how one could be a successful politician while devoting himself to bi bipartisanship. Many knew, who knew and worked with him have commented on his modesty, his civility, his congeniality, and his adherence to evidence. He was all of that. But sometimes this conjures up an image of my dad as a gentle paragon of wisdom floating above the fray dispensing sage advice. <laughs> In reality, my father never shied away from a good political fight. He was a formidable conservative politician in a highly competitive state. He won six terms in the Senate, and when no other Hoosier, when no other Hoosier has been able to even win four. He could cite his margin of success and failure in every election in which he ran going back to his days at Shortridge High School in Indianapolis. He was very proud they exceeded 66% of the vote in four different Senate elections, including an unprecedented 87% of the vote in 2006. No other Senate candidate in Indiana history has won uh, more than 64% of the vote, and no governor has exceeded 62% of the vote in the post-Civil War era. I relate these facts to show how much Richard Luger, my father, embraced political competition and debate. In one election cycle, he even ran the National Republican Senatorial Committee, one of the most political jobs in Washington, D.C., as you know. He saw no contradiction between the demands of a competitive political life and fulfilling the needs of a country while maintaining the highest standards of honor and fairness. He proved that one could do both. My dad's devotion to the concept of bipartisanship bipartisanship went beyond f finding partners from the other party for his initiatives. He believed that elected officials had a responsibility to foster unity. He understood that this would not always be possible, but he believed that the national strength and road to democracy required elected officials to seek consensus whenever possible. I would like to quote my dad, quote, who explained the outlook better than I can. Particularly destructive is the misperception in some quarters that governing with one vote more than 50% is just good or better than governing with 60, or percent, 60 to 70% support. Under this theory, compromise is necessary to achieve greater consensus among the American people in Congress, merely dilute the strength of one's partisan accomplishments. The problem with this thinking is that whatever is won today through division is usually lost tomorrow. The relationships that are destroyed and ill will that is created makes subsequent achievements that are much, much more difficult. If the minority is not a participant, it begins to see its job as frustrating the majority. A 51% mentality deepens cynicism, sharpens political vendettas, and depletes the national reserve of goodwill that is critical to our survival in hard times. Leaders should not con content themselves with 51% if they can expand a working majority through outreach, judicious rhetoric, bipartisan alliances, and thought, thought, thoughtful argumentation." Unquote. The challenge before us today is how to repair our national political culture over the long term to ensure that the values that have sustained our democracy are preserved and strengthened. Admittedly, few people get elected in this era dominated by social media by defending norms and institutions. But we, cannot, we, we should not lose our optimism. I know that both the Luger Center and the Javits Foundation will continue our work to uplift American democracy. I'll give my dad the last word. In a 2015 speech at the University of Illinois, he said, quote, I have not lost my enthusiasm for the potential of the American political process, and neither should you. The inherent strengths and traditions of American democracy far outweigh any recent erosion of our political culture. We have lived through eras far more difficult than the present one, and we possess all that is necessary to build upon the great American experiment." Unquote. Thank you very much again to the Javits Foundation for all you being here this morning. The Luger family is very honored to accept this award this morning. Thank you so much.
so last, um, Playbook this morning called this event Impeachment Counterprogramming, and I think you can see why, <laughs> both from what we heard today and what we heard from Senator Luger's son. Uh, my name is Michelle Jolin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of an organization called Results for America, which is focused on building bipartisan cooperation around investing in what works. Um, I have the, uh, we've had the honor of working with the Javits family over the last several years to uh, select the folks who have been doing what works, um, bridging the, across the aisle, and um, building you know, sort of a more bipartisan culture by having bipartisan impact. And so we're deeply thankful that we have been able to do this with the Javits family. My job is to give a bunch of thank yous. So thank you, John, for your commitment to carrying on the bipartisan legacy of your father through the important work of the Luger Center. Let's have another one. <laughs> Special thanks to Senator Young, Congressman Jeffries, and Congressman Collins and all of their team who we've been working with very closely for their compelling remarks about the importance of bipartisanship. I also wanna thank the Bechtel Foundation for their support of this event and the bipartisan Javits Prize for 2019. And lastly, I wanna thank the, the Javits family, Carla, Joy, and Josh. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you on the Javits uh, and the rest of the Javits Family Foundation. Um, to uh, support your father's legacy, and so we deeply appreciate that. Now I want to thank you all for joining us today and celebrating bipartisanship, and please stay for a cup of coffee and some breakfast. Um, and uh, again, thank you all for being here. <laughs>